Welcome to another virtual edition of Zoom City Talk as we continue to broadcast remotely during the uh, endless pandemic. I'm John McIntyre. Hope you're doing well considering. And our first guest today is Muhammad Bernie, who is a legislative aide for Northside Councilman Bobby Wilson. Muhammad, welcome to the program. Hi, how are you? Uh, doing well considering. How about yourself? Well, it's another scorching day, so we're working remotely and trying not to sweat ourselves out of existence. But. Yes, for some reason, the location I'm in, they've turned off the air conditioning and, and opened the windows. I have no idea why. <laughs> That's tragedy. <laughs> At any rate, is that is that a plant you had well before the pandemic, or is that a, a plant you got so you'd have cool things to have in the background, you know, during interviews? Uh, I, 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 I have a huge um, plant obsession, and this is a plant that I've had for... It's a jade. It's a Chinese jade. I've had it huh. for probably 10 years at this point. Um, I mean, I got it fairly large, and it's only gotten bigger. So well, It looks like you've taken good care of it, for whatever that's worth. Apparently, the trick to this plant is you just don't do anything. You don't even look at it. And it <laughs> so much as look at it, and it starts dropping leaves and, you know, causing problems. Well, I hope I haven't jinxed all of that by making <laughs> mention of it. Yeah. All right, so for the uninitiated out there, people who are just sort of curious about what we city workers do all day, what does the legislative aid uh, do? Well, the, the biggest thing that a legislative aid should do um, is stay on top of the legislation that comes through city council every week on Tuesdays and Wednesdays uh, at the regular and standing uh, council meetings. Uh, largely that means when it first shows up and it's first introduced in city council, uh, it's my job to read all of the attached text that comes with the bill that you see on the agenda for the public and uh, make sure I understand it to the best of my ability and then explain it to the council person uh, if necessary, uh, you know, to the best of my ability. And to the degree that that stops, I then have to go and find the people in city government who are responsible for bringing it to the council and have them explain it. Uh, the other specific thing, uh, more specific to the uh, Councilman Wilson is that um, because he's chair of the Land Use and Economic Development Committee, legislation that comes through that committee, it's really our job to stay on top of what that department is doing and to be aware of what legislation they're going to be bringing forward. And if there's going to be any issues, then making sure that other council people are aware of this legislation that's coming one day, a week, two weeks, a month, six months from now, and um, sort of getting more in the nuts and bolts of that committee-specific legislation before it's even written up and introduced. Uh, that sounds like a lot of work. And of course, you guys have been able to work uh, through the pandemic, but a lot more uh, Zoom meetings and fewer meetings in chambers. Yes. Yeah. Zoom has become our office for all intents and purposes. We do everything on Zoom. Uh, uh, so I'm sure you didn't count on um, the pandemic, as I think none of us did uh, before it all punched us in the face. Um, how is it complicated? You're just trying to get your job done. I think initially the complication stemmed from the fact that we all assumed this was going to last hilariously, like two weeks, a month. Right. Like it was a temporary <laughs> blip. And so we didn't really adjust to being, um, uh, to working remotely in a sort of semi-permanent, almost permanent fashion. So there's a lot of this like, oh, well, we can do this when we come back or we can pick this up when we get back. Like a lot of essential city government functions that you know, we just assumed we would get, be able to get back to fairly soon. And so we kind of let go for two, three, four weeks. Um, and then at a certain point, it dawned on us, as I think it dawned on everybody, we're doing this for the indefinite future. And we just need to get our heads around that um, in every respect. Um, I think it was an adjustment for everybody. I think especially for your department, for INP, to help get us situated so we could just continue working remotely for as long as this takes. Yeah, and for the uninitiated, we're the Department of Innovation and Performance, and we sort of make sure everybody's computers, or try to anyway, work, and that they have the computers they need. And it's a good point. It did become a much more essential department, probably, than it was uh, Over before. Yeah. Um, interesting. So uh, what are some interesting pieces of legislation that you've been working on so far? Or tell us about some of your uh, priorities. And you're, you're very young in office. You've only been in there a few months, just so people know. Sure, sure. Well, let's see. Uh, just as a, you know, as a, this occupied probably two or three weeks of my summer. Um, but, and ultimately we decided it wasn't the time to do it. But as I'm sure you remember, a few weeks ago, it has calmed down now, but a few weeks ago, every night at sunset going forward, 
the city would be alive with the sound of fireworks. And, you know, we had a lot of constituents call and ask us, hey, what's the deal with this? What's the law on this? Um, can we do anything about it? You know, we were seeing reports of uh, buildings being damaged. Thankfully, we didn't have too many injuries uh, over the course of the summer, but property damage, public, especially property that's publicly owned, like parks and such, um, uh, being scorched. So I sort of had to get up to speed really quick on what our ordinances allow us to uh, control and regulate and what they don't, and in contrast, what the state does, and then see if there's any legislation that we could pass that would have any sort of an impact on the nightly fireworks spectacular that we were experiencing. Uh, ultimately, we decided not to go forward with it because we're waiting on Harrisburg to pass a uh, piece of legislation that would give a second class city like Pittsburgh much more power to regulate fireworks, not just in public areas. But it was one of those interesting things where publicly, fundamentally, there wasn't a piece of legislation we could point to and say, well, this is what we did. But the background to get to that decision of not doing anything and letting the state give us the power to do much more a few weeks or months in the future um, was one of those classic legislative aid stories. You know, it's all happening in the deep. And <laughs> as far as public is concerned, all I'm telling them is, hey, here's a law, like you can call 911, that's within your right, within your purview. There aren't really more enforcement powers that we can enact at this point overnight. And here's why, and it's a reasonable thing, but when people are being tormented by fireworks, reasonableness, I think, goes out the window um, pretty quickly. <laughs> All that is fascinating to me because other than not being able to go outside or do what you want to do, that's probably the most, the thing about which I've heard the most complaints over the last several weeks. And some people in some neighborhoods, it's still going on. Yeah. And they're still complaining. In the north side, and we still occasionally hear fireworks. It calmed down dramatically after July 4th, but it's not gone, you know. Right. Yeah. And I don't remember in years past it lasting endlessly. It seems like a new annoying trend. Yeah, I mean, I think our theory, again, this is one of the things that I discovered in the process of doing this research. I think one explanation psychological was that because there weren't public fireworks shows, everything from the Pirates winning ball games and having fireworks to the 4th of July uh, fireworks uh, that happened in the city, um, people felt the need or the desire to you know, do that privately. But also a lot of people who sell fireworks suddenly had all these institutional buyers who hadn't bought them and it's not like fireworks are good, I think, for a long time. So they were selling them for a huge discount, much more powerful fireworks to, you know, your neighbor and my neighbor. <laughs> um, and there was also a pretty thriving secondary market where people are buying those fireworks in different states, bringing them back here and selling them for a steep markup, which again, in the pandemic and all the economic damage that has caused, if you're going to be entrepreneurial, this was a very easy thing to do. But it was also the kind of consideration that led council to think, well, maybe this won't be an issue next summer if things are improved by next summer and we're not all sitting at home and the economy is in shambles. There won't be the market demand for this sort of activity happening illicitly. So, you know. No uh, interesting. Problems. Yeah. Uh, so tell us uh, a little bit of the uh, Muhammad Bernie story. Where are you from originally? How'd you end up in Pittsburgh? Sure. Um, whenever I get asked that question, it's very difficult to answer. I'm fundamentally from everywhere and nowhere. Uh, <laughs> I moved to this country when I was 11 from Saudi Arabia. My parents are Indian. They moved there, my parents are physicians, and they moved there to work um, in a public hospital where you know, there was a career ladder. For them. And after a few years, they decided they wanted to give their kids more opportunities. I'm the oldest of four. So they moved to this country, um, and my dad sort of restarted his training here at the age of 40. Um, and so I've lived in, you know, we moved to California, I live in California, in Michigan, uh, in, in New Jersey, in Missouri. I graduated from high school in Missouri, in a small town actually, in the boot heel of Missouri, uh, that is Rush Limbaugh's hometown. And I think partly as a function of that being the place I came of age politically, as soon as I could, I moved far away to Berkeley, California, back to California. And I was there for four or five years at the start of my late teens, early 20s and working in politics, working um, for local campaigns, uh, public interest campaigns, not candidates. And I sort of got more and more into the political world and further and further away from working for elected officials after they win. Ultimately, it led to you know, working on, wanting to work on a presidential campaign. And when President Obama's re-election campaign came knocking, um, 
I applied, was hired, and they sent me out to Pennsylvania to a battleground state. And they told me, pick Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. Like, it's up to you. And I had never visited. I had no idea. Coming from California, I had a snobbish sort of, oh, what's the difference? Like, it's a small state. No big deal. <laughs> you know, um, it's a huge difference. And politically, it was a completely different education. But I also fell in love with Pittsburgh uh, in 2010, 2011. Um, and I stayed through the election to 2012. And then I just realized it made more sense for me to, you know, sort of plant my life a little more firmly here. And uh, I've been here for since 2010. Um, but a couple of years ago, I decided to go and complete my undergraduate degree. And so I moved away to do that and just moved back last summer into the north side. Um, and okay. directly. So what was the name of that small town in Missouri that you spent some time in? Cape Girardeau, Missouri. All right. I'm, I went to school in Southern Illinois, so I'm familiar with Cape Girardeau. Right. I took my SATs at, in Carbondale. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's head, the headquarters of the uh, Salukis, the, yeah. the town with the mascot that no one's ever heard of ever. No, no one knows what a Saluki is. No. Um, so, and, uh, so is that an annoying question? Hey, where are you from? Because you have to spend a few. I mean, well, I was, I'm, I'm interested in, but you know. The great thing now is I have started saying Pittsburgh because there you go. every tan tangible sense as an adult, when I wasn't being dragged around by my parents, I chose to be in Pittsburgh. I chose twice, actually. I chose the first time to come. And then after graduating from college uh, last year, again, I was like, I'm going back to Pittsburgh and I'm sinking my roots here. So, and I've been here for a decade, which is a long time in a 30 year old man's life. So this is home for me now. Uh, that's great. So do you ever have any thoughts of actually running for elected office or do you enjoy the behind the scenes uh, policy wonk work? I, I, I really enjoy the behind the scenes policy wonk thing. I mean, I had the privilege of watching probably a half dozen elected officials at every level of government from U.S. Senate to city council. And it is a demanding, demanding job. And frankly, I think it would chew up and spit out anybody who's not prepared uh, in their bones, in the minutia. Uh, for what they're signing up for. So there's a great deal that I had to learn over many years before I could even remotely contemplate something like that. So is there anything you, uh, we all miss a lot of things uh, while we're sort of more isolated than we used to be. Anything particular you can't wait to get back to oh, yeah. whenever I, that is? <laughs> uh, going to the movies. Huge. I, so going to the movies is like this, I do it by myself. I do it in the middle of the work week. Um, you know, take an evening off. This was my like way to decompress during campaigns when you don't really have any time to decompress. It was my way to decompress um, in school and not being able to go to movie theater is absolutely crushing. And I can't wait till we get back to at least that level of public health that movie theaters are open up. Oh, uh, for sure. Well, Muhammad Bernie, um, we're definitely happy you decided to make Pittsburgh your new adopted hometown. Uh, that's a hell of a plant. <laughs> And I cannot thank you enough for joining us on uh, a Zoom edition of City Talk. Thank you, John. Uh, coming up, we'll meet someone from the mayor's office. Stay with us. Todd's a great guy. I mean, look at him. What a sweetheart. boy. Wait. Todd, what are you doing? How totally selfish and untod like of you. Come on, Todd. Come on, man. Welcome back to City Talk. There are many, many interesting people in the mayor's office, uh, the office of Mayor uh, Bill Peduto, and one of them is Ricardo Williams, uh, and he's our next guest. Welcome to the program. Oh, thank you, John, for having me. Do you prefer Rick, Ricardo? Rick is fine. Most people know me by Rick Williams. Okay. You have had a job there for a while and you just switched, correct me if I'm wrong, at the beginning of the year. So what did you used to do and what are you doing now? I was the manager of equity inclusion when I came in 2015. And in January, my position shifted to the business, business inclusion manager. All right. If you don't mind, tell us a little bit about what each uh, entails. Okay. Um, as a manager of equity inclusion, uh, when I came on in 2015, I oversaw the equity of uh, the Equal Opportunity Review Commission. And the Equal Opportunity Review Commission uh, comprised of 11 volunteers 
uh, appointed by the mayor to review city contracts in construction and professional services. Um, and I was brought into under the Bureau of Neighborhood Empowerment in which we did a lot of work in the areas of like workforce development, education, small business and contracting. And basically the Bureau of Neighborhood Empowerment at the time uh, was kind of like the triage type of unit to, to be the, I guess the, the middleman, so to speak, to avoid a lot of the red tape that goes on in our city departments to kind of clear the path uh, to help city residents. And then through the work, um, it, we, we really saw that uh, there were a lot of equity issues in that work. And recently, I guess last year, May of last year, um, we trans transitioned into the Office of Equity. All right, and then what are you, the duties of the new ones that you're uh, currently encountering? Currently, as the business inclusion manager, um, I guess let me kind of tell you about the role that I played as far as the Equal Opportunity Review Commission. Uh, okay. We were more of a compliance and internal compliance unit um, that oversaw participation for minority and women businesses. So to make sure that a certain amount of minority and women businesses were taking part in any project that involved taxpayers' money? Uh, yes, I would, I would say that. And, and as we look at participation on certain contracts, we knew we can get more. And, and so in doing that work, we set up a nice compliance setup um, system, um, diversity management software uh, to be able to track contracts. Um, we didn't have the capability to be able to do that prior to my arrival. Um, and so moving fast forward to January of this year, um, I'm the business inclusion manager, and my role is really to bring in vendors that the city needs uh, in procurement in our various cities departments. Um, we we noticed in doing the work that we we needed to have someone that was kind of like the client representative as a bank. If if you would look at a bank, someone representing the clients and being able to do um, business development. And, and bringing in and getting business. And so that's kind of my role now with the city in that capacity. Uh, and how do the two differ? And do you enjoy this one more or is it sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other? Well, I, I, I like talking to people. Uh, I, I, I like being able to connect people. I, I think that's one of my strengths. Um, but I also am good at doing compliance work too. Uh, but it, it's not fun doing compliance and, and really uh, looking at contracts and, and, and seeing where um, people are short and kind of holding people accountable to what they say they're doing. But so, your old job then it sounds like involved more, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, paperwork and studying and well I'm sure you're studying a lot in the new job, it involves more making personal contact with humans. I, I, I think both jobs you, you contact with humans, okay. but you're, you're, you're kind of being more an evaluator um, and, and looking at things and saying, hey, we're, we're this far in this contract and we said we're going to use this person. Uh, when is this person being utilized on this contract? Or this person did a particular role in this particular project and got paid and they didn't get paid yet or it wasn't agreed upon on what was paid. And so we're kind of, kind of the, like I said before, that we're like the watchdog of, of the city internally. Uh, and that was my role for a number of years. And now I'm, I'm on the other side of it saying, um, these, are the, these are the needs of the city and how we're matching uh, the current, I guess, contracting workforce um, to the needs of our various departments. So would some people say you were the bad guy and now you're one of the good guys? <laughs> um, I guess so now I'm more the mediator versus uh, I wouldn't say a bad guy, but but just someone just holding people accountable. Well, yeah, you, I, I shouldn't have used that word, those words, because you're, you, we need somebody to hold people accountable. Uh, I'm, I'm that part guy. of the team. <laughs> right, right. I understand. I just I'm mean if I, if, if I was being held accountable, I might be like, oh, great, here comes Rick Williams. Yeah, yeah here's Rick Williams, the internal watchdog. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, but now I'm not Rick Williams, the internal watchdog. I'm Rick Williams, the client representative. Cool. Uh, well, it's always good to change things up every now and then. So give us the Rick Williams story a little bit. Where are you from? Um, where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up here in East Liberty. Uh, went to Peabody High School. Uh, went to um, Pitt for my undergrad uh, for business administration and uh, 
got a master's in nonprofit at Robert Morris University. And how did you end up in uh, city government? Um, it's, it's, it's interesting uh, that, that my path was kind of non-traditional. Um, when the mayor came on in 2014, uh, he wanted um, a staff that really didn't have connections uh, with government. Um, no government operatives and, and so forth. So uh, he had a fair process through Talent City. Uh, we've interviewed for that process and a number of us who came on board, um, this was our first time in the government. So that, I went through that process, got interviewed and um, I'm proud to be a, a servant of the city. Do you remember what you thought it was gonna be and how did it end up matching your expectations or maybe not matching your expectations? You know, I was I was very cautious about it and didn't have any, John, to, to be <laughs> honest with you. Um, you. You hear what people say about government and what I can honestly say, it's not true. Uh, being on the inside of that, um, me and the, my colleagues, we really work hard to serve the people. And and unfortunately, they don't really get to see the, the type of work and the hours that we spend in trying to help people. How are you coping with everything during the uh, global pandemic? Uh, it, it's been kind of tough. Uh, I have two little kids uh, uh, that- oh, I'm so, I'm so probably, sorry to hear that. <laughs> that um, I have to help in, in, in far as assignments and so forth. Uh, we just got word last week that we're gonna be out for another nine weeks uh, doing the same thing when school starts. So um, I'm learning how to be an elementary school teacher right now. Um, I, have a I have daughters that are in fourth and first grade. Uh, so it's gonna be a little challenge for me. Uh, but you know, this is kind of the way of the world right now until we find a vaccine to, to, to solve this pandemic going on. Uh, but we'd spoken earlier and you mentioned to me that you'd set up a little uh, mock schoolhouse, like a, a little area where they're gonna know that it's time for business here and it's time for learning. <laughs> Uh, I mean, basically, you know, my, my daughter has a loft bed and uh, in the loft bed, she has a desk um, to be able to do her schoolwork. Um, my daughter actually hangs out with me on the kitchen room table here and uh, she does her work on her tablet. I do my work on, on my tablet and I make calls and, and, and send them to the rooms accordingly when I have to have meetings like this with you. So. Uh, awesome. And um what is it you miss most uh, about, you know, what you're no longer able to do, or at least temporarily no longer able to do? What, what, what is it you can't wait to do when it's done, whenever that is? I just need to take a vacation somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go to the beach or something and just let the water hit my feet and uh, just relax a little bit because this has really been uh, a, a trying time. Um, COVID-19 started when it's cold and now it's the summer and we still have it and uh, we're kind of restricted to our quarters, so to speak, working. Yeah, I guess if you just go waiting in the Monongahela, it's not going to be the same as like being in Aruba or something. No, no. Plus the, the water isn't clear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and meantime, back at the home front, you and your wife and your kids are managing to stay sane and not uh, kill each other. No. Uh, we try to, you know, have movie night at the house and we'll download something, you know, and watch a good Netflix movie and, and, and try to have that. I mean, everyone needs to have some me time um, away from the constant grind because that's that's the challenge right now, you know. And but also, it's been a good time too because you got to learn yourself a little bit, learn your kids and learn your family in a whole different way because you're always kind of shuffling between you know work and school and home and, and so forth. Everything is here, um, so you see a different side of people. And is most of what you've seen good so far? Or? I, I would say. I mean, I, I see some things with my daughters that I probably need to, you know, be more involved uh, as a father. Um, so, I, you know, I'm going to be working on that uh, and, and upgrading my parenting skills. <laughs> good luck with all that. Thanks. Uh, Rick Williams, thanks so much for being uh, with us on City Talk today. It was nice talking to you. Likewise. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And that is it for this Zoom edition of City Talk. We will see you next time.